All right, so thanks for having us today. We're so excited to be here to tell you about uh, the potential of AI in the NICU. So first I'd like to make a disclaimer. This is my conflict of interest slide um, about how I got interested in neonatology. Um, so I've been uh, slowly convinced over the course of the last five or six years uh, that the NICU is one of the most exciting places to think about artificial intelligence. Uh, you can only have so many dinner conversations with someone uh, before you start to hear not problems, but opportunities. And so we're gonna try and chart a little bit of the opportunities in the NICU for you today um, and how AI can help neonatologists care for their patients better. Um, I also wanna be clear about something else. I think we're living in one of the most exciting periods in the history of science. I think that when you talk about AI, this is always right below the surface, but I wanna make my bias clear on this is that not just in neonatology, not just in medicine, but across a lot of science. There are so many different things happening that are so exciting uh, that have been enabled by AI that I truly think that we will look back on this and think about this period as one of the most exciting periods in the history of science. I'll be around for the rest of the day. I'm not gonna totally justify this claim in this talk. I'll be happy to give you more details uh, later today, but I also wanna be clear about um, this um, um, axiom of mine because it informs a lot of the way that I think about different problems. So I wanna talk about what has happened over the last decade in AI that makes me think this. And I think when we look back over the last 10 years of AI, we can break it into two periods. One is the supervised learning era. And this is when we take traditional problems that we use prediction models for, I uh, think BPD calculators, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, but regression models, things like that. We have annotated data and we build a model uh, to predict that outcome. What changed over the last 10 years is how big those models are and how much data we use to train them. We were able to get uh, physician level performance on lots of diagnostic medical imaging tasks, lots of other prediction tasks. Uh, but really what we did was take existing ideas and scale them with more data. What happened over the last five years though has been qualitatively and fundamentally different. We are now in what's called the self-supervised learning era. And these are machine learning and AI models that let us ask and answer an entirely new class of questions. We no longer need the human annotations and we're able to train essentially huge models on internet scale data and that has enabled a fundamentally new set of capabilities. Here's an a couple examples of supervised learning from the, the last uh, 10 years. And what we really have seen is diagnostic medical imaging tasks uh, we've seen machine learning models that can do that at or above position level performance. Now that's another one of those controversial claims, and I'm happy to provide more justification for that later today if you want to find me. Um, but in, uh, for things like ophthalmology, dermatology, radiology, pathology, basically if the task is um, having a clinician look at an image and render a diagnosis on the basis of that image, there is now an AI system that can do that almost as well or as well in some cases as, as their human counterpart. What's more is there has been a spate of FDA approvals. So there are now FDA approved devices that are powered by deep learning and AI uh, that can render a diagnosis with no physician oversight. This is particularly true in ophthalmology where the first of these so-called autonomous AI systems were developed. Um, but basically if you're trying to do something like diagnose diabetic retinopathy, there is now an autonomous AI system that can do that diagnostic task with no physician oversight. And that has been approved by the FDA. So this truly is a sea change moment uh, in the history of medical AI. What's more is there are actually reimbursement models for these systems. Uh, the AMA issued a CPT code for an autonomous AI system for the first time. So you can actually bill and be re reimbursed for uh, an autonomous AI system. Um, and again, that is a, a, a landmark event and something that really doesn't have a lot of precedent. So what has happened since we've moved beyond supervised learning is we've entered this self-supervised learning era. And the, the key challenge with supervised learning is we need a lot of annotations. So if we're, we're, if we're developing a system to read chest x-rays, we need radiologists to sit down and look at all those chest x-rays and tell us the contents of those images. Self-supervised learning helps address uh, the challenge with annotations. Uh, so that's very time consuming, it's very labor intensive, it's very expensive to be frank. Uh, you often have to pay you know, healthcare workers, physicians, nurses to, an to annotate that data. What self-supervised learning has helped us do is to move away from that. We can now take large amounts of unstructured data, and what we do is we teach a model to play a game with this data. Uh, it's usually a very simple game, like predict the next word in a sequence of text, or tell me which image goes with which radiology report. Uh, but we, we essentially teach the model to play games with our data. And the trick with self-supervised learning is that teaching it to play this game well results in a lot of downstream capabilities that we actually care about. We actually don't care about the game. 
We care about what the game teaches the, the, the algorithm to do. And this often looks like taking part of our data, hiding it, and having the model predict the, the part of the data that we've hidden. Um, and again, the, the idea is that the, if the model learns to play this game well, it's going to be good on the downstream tasks that we care about. By far, the most well-known example of this is ChatGPT. So I think we probably have all heard of ChatGPT. I saw Ben uh, give a talk on ChatGPT yesterday. And ChatGPT is an instance of these self-supervised learning models. It's, it's worth thinking about what ChatGPT has learned to do. It hasn't learned to do diagnosis. It hasn't explicitly been trained on any medical task at all. The only thing that ChatGPT knows how to do is to predict the next word in a sentence. So uh, you, the, the people who created ChatGPT downloaded the entire text content of the internet, fed it one word at a time to ChatGPT, and just said, what word comes next? And so you can think about the dog runs fast. That's the only thing ChatGPT has learned to do. And all that is is an autocomplete model, right? That's not something that's obviously going to give rise to all these fantastic capabilities uh, that we know ChatGPT has. Um, but if you think about what it has to do to be able to play that game well, it actually has to have a lot of world knowledge. Uh, if you're asking it to predict the next word in a very large, complicated passage of text, it not only has to know syntax, uh, grammar, uh, world models, and concepts, it has to know, essentially, some general form of intelligence to be able to play this game well. Um, and again, ChatGPT has no specialized medical training. Kristen will show you some of the work that we've done with ChatGPT but it has this emergent phenomenon of intelligence uh, by learning to play this game. And that is what self-supervised learning has helped us do, is to unlock new forms of intelligence by teaching models to play these games. And we don't have to collect large amounts of annotated data. And so again, that has really allowed us to ask and answer an entirely new set of questions uh, that the previous uh, supervised models haven't. So what I really wanted to do with this portion of the talk is to give you two different ways to think about AI. One is making traditional models that we had bigger, better, stronger, faster. It allows us to answer this, the existing set of questions very well. But what's happening now is very different with self-supervised learning models. We're able to ask and answer an entirely new set of questions. And that's what truly makes me so excited about the era that we're in now is that we have the ability to ask questions that were impossible to articulate using sort of previous traditional prediction models. Um, so with that, I'll give you an extra two minutes. All right, so thank you so much for having us here today. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about is, as the clinician of this two-part you know, partnership, um, how does AI for the NICU actually, how do we think about AI for the NICU? So first of all, for those of us who are clinicians in the room, we know that anytime you walk into a NICU, this is kind of what you see. So you see this, you see a baby in an isolate or a warmer, and so this baby is giving us all kinds of data. So we're seeing information from the delivery room, we're seeing ventilator data, antibiotics, lab data, our exam, the parental involvement and what the parents can tell us about um, what's going on in the room, just the environment, neurologic. So, I mean, there's tons of data that's coming in. And so what we really think is that in the NICU, because of all of this data that we're getting, machine learning and artificial intelligence can really utilize this data source and help us um, predict new outcomes and improve the outcomes for our babies. So for, you know, there are examples of NICU supervised learning that we all know about already, and we may not necessarily be aware of them. So a lot of them are logistic regression things that we deal with every day. So there are a lot of sepsis risk prediction tools already out there. So like in SOFA or the HERO score. So the HERO score was developed at UVA and uses large amounts of heart rate variability data to predict sepsis risk and other clinical outcomes. We all, I, probably we all know the BPD calculator through the NICHD and the BPD calculator uses a logistic regression, which is a type of you know, machine learning if you're breaking things down in that way to predict the severity of BPD. We have ROP screening and diagnostic tools which aren't used as much. Um, but they are out there and they're using machine learning to just take the retinal image and predict what, our, um, what degree of ROP you have. And there's many others that are already out there that we're using. So as part of that, we wanted to see if we could predict BPD better. So um, using the pediatrics data set, which some of you may be familiar with, it has very granular data day by day um, on all of this stuff that I showed you in a few slides ago. 
We used all of that data, used a big model called a transformer model. As a clinician in this, I would defer any questions about exactly what the transformer is doing to Andrew, but um, basically it's a much larger model that's using all of these data and matching it together um, to create a better prediction. So the prior models that we're all aware of usually come out with an AUC of somewhere between 0.6 to 0.7, 0.75. This model, you can see the AUCs um, are plotted and they show you that as you gather more data each day, your AUC improves over time. And the AUC ultimately achieved, we ultimately achieved an AUC of about 0.87 on the first day of life, first day of life to predict BPD. But we have these tools, we know some of these tools exist, but they're not really being used in a way that we think could actually help clinical outcomes. So why? So we did a survey of some clinicians, um, a national survey, it was about 350 responses, which is probably um, a decent sample of neonatologists. Um, and we asked, what tools are you using and why are you not using them? So the ones we asked about were the BPD calculator, sepsis risk calculator, Billy tool, um, and the NICHD early outcomes tool. And we found that overall these tools have really variable use and uptake generally. We found that it's often a discrepancy between what the tools are providing as actionable guidance and if they're providing predicted probabilities. So more often, the tools that are giving you actionable clinical guidance are used more often. So sepsis risk and Billy tool, they tell you what to do, so you want to use those. Um, but if you're getting just a predicted probability of the risk of something developing, so the risk of BPD developing or the risk of a poor neurodevelopmental outcome, those aren't used as often because there's a lot of variability in how those are developed and how they are implemented in your institution. A lot of reason these weren't used as well is just lack of implementation into the EHR. So if you're having to go outside of your EHR and click a bunch of different times, we're already overloaded with clicks and so we don't want to do that. So if it's implemented into your daily workflow, you're more likely to use these tools. And then there's also a lack of trust of the data. Where's the data coming from? How's the data being used in these models by clinicians that are using these tools? Um, and all of this is just to outline that these are essential things to understand if we're going to use AI machine learning to um, build new prediction models and implement them into care. So just because you can predict something doesn't mean it's going to impact clinical outcomes. And so those are the things we really need to understand before this becomes really widespread in the NICU or in medicine. So let me talk a little bit about chat GPT because I think while this is going to be, this is gonna be included in all aspects of medicine, but first, what does chat GPT even know about neonatology? Well, we wanted to find out. So we took all 900 questions from the board review, which I'm sure Ben and Daphne know very well, from the board review book by Brodsky and Martin. We entered each question manually into ChatGPT, um, and we asked for ChatGPT's best answer and the justification. Could ChatGPT essentially pass NICU boards? It's an interesting question. Um, no, <laughs> it can't. Um, so it answered about 47% of the questions correctly. And there was a really large variability in the accuracy by topic. So about 40% in gastroenterology, 80% in ethics, interestingly. We did this twice. So we entered the questions twice just to see if there was um, you know, consistency between the two categories. And it was the same in both. They were pretty consistent. We also, because I work with Dr. Brodsky, um, got them to grade the answer responses that ChatGPT gave us. Um, and this is currently under review and so will be published shortly. But I think it's just interesting to think about, right? So ChatGPT is going to be used by everyone in medicine. It's gonna be used by med students, residents, everything. It's gonna be used by parents too. And I think what we need to understand is before we're utilizing ChatGPT in you know, regular practice, we need to understand how it's answering these questions. As a disclaimer, AI moves fast. So we did this with ChatGPT when it was GPT-3, and now there's a whole new version, GPT-4, which probably would do much better on NICU boards um, than just this, but because AI moves so fast, um, we haven't been able to do that yet. So I think in summary, what we really wanted to stand up here and say today is that I think the NICU is a really exciting place for AI. 
I think we can really make a lot of difference in the outcomes that we're predicting in the care of our babies and how we're actually doing the medicine. I think like I just pointed out, AI moves fast though, and agility in this field is super necessary. Like we have to be able to switch course. We have to be able to, you know, move where AI is going very quickly. And sometimes that's really hard to do in academics and in medicine in general. We're not always known as the most agile bunch. Um, collaboration is so key for this. So collaboration between institutions, between different fields. So we, you know, I married a collaborator, <laughs> um, but so I don't necessarily think you have to do that. But I do think like, you know, collaborating between computer scientists and medicine, like we can't go at this alone and we need all fields to really move it forward. And I think AI in this field is really giving us the opportunity to be creative and think of new and innovative solutions for um, neonatology and for medicine in general. As a shameless plug, there is a group of neonatologists that are interested in this and how AI can shape our field. Um, and so we together have created a group called NeoMind AI, um, stands for Neonatal Machine Learning Innovation Development and Artificial Intelligence. It is truly in its infancy, um, but if you're interested in it, I'm happy to connect you with us and others who are interested in this field. So I hope we excited you about AI in the NICU today and have given you a lot of things to think about for the future. Thanks.